The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the Power Electronic Society webinar series. Thank you all for joining today. We bring to you the webinar Granular Architecture and Magnetics for Advanced Power Conversion, presented by Minji Chen on Control and Modeling of Power Electronics, Princeton University, USA. First, we have some housekeeping announcements. Today, webinar will be placed on the Power Electronic Society Research Center within the next week. We invite you all to use the questions function on your panel to ask any questions you might have regarding the content or any broadcast related issues. Questions regarding content will be answered verbally at the end of the webinar. Information on how to request a PDH certificate has been sent to you via the chat function and will also be included in the follow-up email you will receive within one hour of completion of the webinar. I will now welcome Professor Menji Chen so he can begin his presentation. We hope you enjoy the webinar. All right, uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, my name is Minji Chen. I'm a assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at Princeton University. Uh, today is my pleasure to talk a little bit about our, about our research on uh, granular architecture and magnetics for advanced power conversion. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce my group. Uh, currently, we have about eight grad students and a few postdocs uh, in our group, and we work with undergrad students. Uh, this is a picture recently we took with Professor John Kasakian uh, of MIT visiting us. Uh, he's at, in the middle, uh, and this is our entire uh, class in this year's Advanced Polytronics Lecture. Uh, we also work closely with industry and government agencies, uh, and here are all the companies and, and and government agencies that we work with. So I want to acknowledge their support uh, so, so that we can do the kind of research that, that we're interested in doing. So uh, I usually make a joke. Uh, uh, I'm not the first Powertronics professor uh, at Princeton. And the first one is actually Joseph Henry, uh, who is uh, who put his name under the inductor unit, Henry. Uh, and this is uh, Henry, Joseph Henry's uh, magnets. And the real one is actually right now in Princeton physics department. And I recently found it, uh, and that's sort of why the reason how, why we came up with the name of Princeton Magnet Project, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, Princeton University is also managing the Princeton Plasma Physics Research Lab, uh, and then this is a fusion um, system using magnetics to constrain the the the, the, the plasma, uh, and that's also like how Princeton is. Uh, generally tied with uh, with energy uh, type of research, and my group is uh, is doing power electronics here. Uh, so in terms of research, we are a full stack power electronics research group. Now uh, we work all the way from materials to circuits to systems. Uh, on the material side, we try to understand and apply and use wide band gap semiconductor devices. Uh, we uh, do research intensively on magnetics and capacitors. Um, and on the circuit level, uh, one of the focus is multi-input, multi-output energy routers. Uh, how do we design powertronic systems that can freely uh, manage multi-way energy flow? Uh, and also, we do quite a lot of um, um, projects on uh, hybrid switch capacitor magnetic circuits. How do we combine switch capacitor circuits with magnetics to create system-level design uh, uh, benefits? Uh, and on application level, we look um, uh, very broad uh, on the massive level or, 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 or macro level, we, we, we design Powertronics for grid interface. Uh, on a micro level, we design Powertronics on the chip edge. Uh, how do we supply power to future microprocessors? Uh, and in the middle, like for robotics, for medical devices, for sensors, uh, for Internet of Things, uh, so there are Powertronics Plus X is all, all kinds of interesting applications we uh, Powertronics can enable uh, uh, for, the, for, for future um, um, energy, medical, and sensing systems. So uh, one philosophy that governs the designs uh, that are happening in my group are so-called granular power conversion. Uh, the concept is that how can we replace the traditional sort of centralized polytronic systems uh, into with small building blocks and then recombine the building blocks so that we can create system level design advantage. So how can we break uh, one bulky high voltage, high current power device into many, many smaller ones? How can we break one bulky magnetic components uh, to many small ones and couple them and create new uh, benefits? And how, how can we divide capacitors like what we are already doing uh, for switch capacitor circuits? So really, uh, we're trying to create new opportunities through granular power conversion. 
And in order to do that in a good way, uh, we need deep understanding about materials, circuit systems control, architecture application, and we have to do hardware, software. We have to develop new design methods, understand the scaling factor uh, and performance limits of uh, semiconductor devices, passive components, and circuit architecture. So that's the uh, background. Uh, and then in terms of uh, device scaling law, uh, what we, we should follow is we divide power electronics into uh, semiconductor devices, uh, magnetics, and capacitors, basically R, L, and C. So for semiconductors, we know this, this Baliga figure of Merit saying the, the own resistance times the, the gate charge of a semiconductor device is proportional to V square. And as a result, uh, because it scales faster with V, it's beneficial to divide one high voltage rating device into many, many smaller ones uh, to gain system level advantage and allow us to switch at a higher frequency because low voltage rating devices tend to have uh, smaller parasitics and can switch faster. Uh, so for magnetics, uh, it's very interesting uh, in the fact that uh, magnetics actually, the bigger magnetics give you better power density and performance. And the fundamental reason is that uh, all of the magnetic components has a voltage rating and current rating. Uh, the voltage rating is related to the cross-section area of the magnetic core. The current rating is related to a cross-section area of the copper. So the overall power rating of the magnetic components is proportional to fourth order of the linear scaling factor. A square come from the voltage, square come from the current. Uh, while the volume scales up at the third order, as a result, it's beneficial to have one big magnetic components doing many different tasks than having each individual small magnetic component doing simple work. So you will see a lot of couple magnetic design, which is sort of following this concept. If you have many, many magnetic components in your system, it's always better to find a way to combine them. And finally, for capacitors, it's really indifferent because uh, capacitors are just two, two plates. We're managing the electric field. So it's really indifferent if you have one big capacitor or many, many smaller capacitors. But fundamentally, uh, if you have many smaller capacitors, you can start to think about how can I cancel the repo? How can I do interleaving? So fundamentally, there's no difference in um, dividing capacitors, but practically, uh, there are some benefits by combining, uh, uh, dividing capacitors and combining them in an interesting way. And you'll see some of the examples uh, later. So uh, again, uh, there are two ways of reducing the size. If we're talking about high power density, uh, one way is to make the system switching at a high frequency, because that's, uh, that's fundamentally how do you reduce the energy storage requirements and reduce the passive component size and wide band gap devices allowing us to do that. The other way to push for high power density is to uh, architectural innovation, as I said. So instead of having bulky magnetics capacitors and semiconductors, we divided them to, into smaller pieces. And by canceling the ripple, by reducing the DC flux, we can reduce the energy storage requirements in uh, capacitors and inductors. And that's the other way to allow us to uh, uh, push for extreme power density. And that's why uh, in our, a lot of our designs, you can see that we are on one side, we try to increase the switching frequency uh, so that we can fundamentally reduce the passive component size. On the other side, we try to explore architectural innovation so that the, the, the passive components can be better utilized. Um, so in terms of passive components, there are usually two types, although piezoelectric is emerging, but piezo is also a combination of inductors and capacitors. So fundamentally, we're talking about capacitive energy storage and inductive energy storage. Uh, so capacitors, we know uh, it can offer high energy density uh, and relatively high quality factor, uh, much better than inductors. But in most of the capacitive-based topologies, you are not allowed to cycle the capacitors deeply. Right. Usually you are allowing maybe 10% uh, repo on a switch capacitor circuit. So, so although capacitors has much higher energy density, you're not allowed to usually, you're not allowed, in a DC to DC system, you're not allowed to use the capacitors by much. Versus magnetics, which although it has relatively low energy density, which hurts the power density of the system, uh, but there are a lot of innovations you can do with magnetics, right? You can start to talk about coupling, you can talk about ripple cancellation, their common mode behavior, differential mode behavior. Uh, so really a lot of innovations in power electronics happen in the magnetic domain. So my group is really looking to this hybrid switch class the magnetics design where we can benefit from the high energy density coming from the capacitors, 
uh, and the design flexibility and innovation possibility uh, coming from magnetics. So you'll see quite a lot of uh, different interesting magnetic design uh, throughout this talk. So uh, that comes to, usually I pause, but because this is a webinar, I cannot get uh, receive questions now. So please save your questions towards the end and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and then present some of the technical examples uh, on how do we explore this uh, uh, interesting domain of granular power conversion and how do we uh, benefit from make best use of passive components to get high efficiency and high power density together. And the first example is a miniaturized CPU voltage regulator design, which in my opinion is in an application which asks for the best performance out of powertronics because this powertronics sits next to the high performance processors. So if we ask what's the newest thing uh, in computing, it's probably ChatGPT, right? So everyone is talking about ChatGPT. And if you go to ChatGPT and ask how much energy does it take to train a ChatGPT, and ChatGPT won't tell you, but I was able to find it through Google. Uh, so train a ChatGPT takes uh, 20,000 GPUs. Each of them is about 400 watts, and it's uh, 8 megawatts of power and train for five days. And that's about one gigawatt hours of electricity. And that's sufficient to charge a Tesla for 10,000 times. So massive amount of energy is needed for the future computing. Uh, and the computing system is getting more and more complicated. It's not just talking about uh, powering the processor, but really how do we get power from the grid all the way to processors. So there are all kinds of interesting power trans questions we can ask uh, for the future computing system. And today we'll be focusing on, on CPU voltage regulator, which is the final step of the entire uh, power pipeline, but uh, I highly recommend you to look at the entire, entire, uh, entire system where there are a lot of innovation opportunities. So if we, if we ask the question, um, the power density of the processor, uh, here's a graph which my student and postdoc collected, collected a couple of years ago. Uh, so this is saying uh, as the technology nodes get moving forward, we are, we are putting more and more transistors into the processor and processor is continuously expanding. We're getting, the, the, the die area is getting bigger and bigger. And companies like Google, Facebook, they are putting more and more processors next to each other. Uh, so here on this graph, you can see that as the, 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 the power density of the processor is getting close to about five watts per millimeter square, and the die area is getting close to 600 millimeter, millimeter square. So we're talking about two kilowatts of electricity peak power uh, on these processors, and they are sitting next to each other. If you, you see these golden bricks, these are the power electronics. So power electronics really starting to block the way uh, for chip-to-chip -chip communication. If you're training large language models, you, are, you, are, you have to do cloud computing, uh, and all the computers' processors need access to memories. So there is a strong motivation in reducing the size of the power electronics so that we can open up the way uh, space for for computing. So we are we're really trying to reduce the power electronics so that we can get through this memory wall and power wall for the future uh, processors. And that comes to the concept of vertical power delivery, uh, which uh, comes up about five, six, seven years ago, where instead of trying to deliver power laterally on the motherboard, can we send power vertically? Uh, so we will distribute power at 48 volts high voltage and then do the power conversion uh, vertically in the Z direction uh, and divide, uh, divide it into one volts and high current, a few hundred amps or even thousand amps, and send it to the processor. And this is sort of a future trend because uh, companies like Intel and TSMC are starting to stack uh, stack the, the, the chips because uh, more slot is getting close to the end. Uh, and if we go towards the vertical direction, it's basically linearly scaling the power. Uh, so this is a very interesting design space because uh, it's not like you can stack it forever. So Powertronics also has to be very, very thin. Uh, so we are really asking for Powertronics that is on a few millimeter uh, thickness, but capable of delivering uh, very high current and maintaining high energy efficiency. So 48 volts, 1 volts, very high power density, very low height, the, the thinner the better. Uh, current level goes up and then thermal becomes a problem. Uh, there's a design challenge on control because most of the processors needs dynamic voltage and frequency scaling uh, to save energy and, and improve energy efficiency. And finally, you cannot burn quite a lot of heat uh, in a 3D packaging because uh, pulling the heat out is a, is a challenge. 
So we find it as a really interesting uh, area to explore because we are asking for uh, best performance powertronics here. We really care about energy efficiency, power, power density and efficiency. And that's where this hybrid switch capacitor magnetics approach becomes really interesting because uh, we now can use switch capacitor circuits to sort of divide the 48 volts into multiple smaller voltage domains. Uh, so on a voltage, it's always better to sort of think about capacitors as voltage source. So when you're dealing with high voltage, serious stacking, switch capacitor circuits give you new design opportunities. On the output side, it's uh, flipped, right? So it's one volt, a few hundred amps or thousand amps. So it's always good to think about the inductor-based circuits. And here uh, is some kind of switch inductor circuits connected in parallel. So serious input to deal with the high voltage, parallel output to carry the high current. And if you are carrying high current with inductors, you will naturally need many, many inductors. So it's always good to think about opportunity to combine them, right? So that you can get a, um, uh, you can you can you can reduce the energy storage requirements in the inductors, uh, and canceling the ripple. And that and and also inductors turns out to be the main uh, bottleneck in doing vertical power delivery. They are usually the thickest components uh, overall. Semiconductors are very thin, capacitors are thin, magnetics are not. And designing vertical thing 2D magnetics, the fundamental challenge, and we find it very interesting to ask the question, how do we design vertical couple magnetics carrying a few hundred amps? So in this design space, we're really talking about voltage stress, right? We're dealing with 48 volts, uh, converting it to one volt, and we use switch capacitor circuits to stack in series uh, and then break the voltage domains. Uh, we also concern about the current stress, so we go with multi-phase inductor-based circuits and finally, dynamic speed. Uh, how can we uh, enable dynamic voltage and frequency scaling? Uh, and couple magnetics is really, really good candidates uh, in, in realizing this, this goal. So I also want to highlight some important technologies. When we are thinking about breaking the system from a big system into many, many smaller units, uh, it's very important to think about uh, how can you create mutual advantage. Uh, one limitation of switch capacitor circuits is that um, you, you have to suffer a charge sharing loss whenever you connect capacitors from series to parallel. Uh, but this soft charging technology is a very important technique which uh, allows you to, uh, instead of avoiding putting capacitors in parallel, always connect capacitors in series. So here's just one example. If you want to divide 48 volts to 24 volts, instead of doing a parallel series, parallel series combination, you sort of swap the sequences of the capacitors so that you get a 24 volts without paralleling capacitors and suffering charge sharing loss. This is a concept called soft charging, and we investigated on quite a few uh, different topologies, which allows you to get soft charging of all these capacitors. For example, if you want to get 12 volt out of 48, you can do 48 to 12 uh, to 24, 24 to 12, and keep doing it. So this is a very uh, nice way of dividing high voltages into low voltages. And at the same time, uh, there are other advantages you, you are creating by um, by thinking about granular power conversion is that now you have to worry about voltage sharing uh, on, and current sharing, right? So if all the voltage rating or current rating are not nicely shared, uh, granular power conversion is no longer attractive. And that's why in most of the circuits that, that, that we investigated, we asked the question, does the units offer automatic voltage balancing and current sharing. And some of the circuits do, some of the circuits don't. And the, the circuit here is one example where, because we are charging and discharging the capacitors with different current sources, uh, the charge balancing requirements of the capacitor naturally give you current sharing, which is a very important feature uh, and very important design factor you have to consider when you're doing granular power conversion. Uh, so this is just like high level explanation. And usually when you're asking balancing or, or sharing questions, you have to go to math. So we build the analytical models to, to understand how these granular uh, cells behave uh, facing different dynamics. And we were able to prove that some of the circuits uh, offer automatic uh, voltage balancing and current sharing. Some of them don't. Uh, and if they don't, then you have to um, pay extra resources to, um, to balance them, which uh, is a different topic that we're not going to cover today, act, how to actively balance uh, granular, granular circuits. So then, uh, then it comes to magnetics. Once we have the circuit architecture, uh, it's really good way of combining switch caps. Uh, this is a switch cap front end with a switch inductor back end. 
Uh, and the next question is magnetics. How can we do vertical uh, power delivery with magnetics? How do we send power in the Z direction instead of X and Y? Uh, and this is just one example of a vertical, four-phase vertical couple magnetics, which uh, we have uh, uh, two pieces of magnetic core with wind four sets of windings. And uh, there are different ways of designing it. You can think about magnetics as winding wrapping around the core or core wrapping around the winding. And here, this example is sort of in the middle. Uh, the, the windings come in and wrapping the core for about 90 degrees and going towards the top. And this is the way to uh, get the minimum uh, minimum um, uh, resistance of the winding and also allow enable flux cancellation uh, in the magnetic core and, uh, and then great to reduce the size and improve the transient speed. So in this example, uh, if you're familiar with couple magnetics, usually there are two different terms. There's a ripple inductance uh, and leakage inductance or uh, transient inductance. So the ripple inductance determines uh, the, the, the current ripple uh, in the system and the transient inductance determines the, the speed uh, or common mode behavior of the magnetics. So here, basically, if we look at the ripple, it looks like an 85 nano Henry inductor. And if we look at a transient, it looks like a 12 nano Henry inductor. So we are talking about about six times uh, a reduction in ripple given, given the same uh, transient speed. So, so a lot of interesting questions you can, you, a lot of interesting design opportunities if you dive deep into magnetics. Uh, and especially there are, there are new design constraints where you are also asking for a very, very thin uh, thickness uh, for the magnetic structure to enable vertical power delivery. Uh, so we spent about three years on this uh, we, in, in collaboration with Google and Intel. Uh, we actually followed Intel uh, 18 months uh, 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 generation. Well, every 18 months, Intel is trying to put two times more transistors into the microprocessor. So here we are asking the question, can we spend 18 months designing a first version and another 18 months designing a second version and we were able to do that? So this is our first version, which was published 2021. It's our Lego point of load converter, uh, which can quite a significant impact. Uh, and a lot of other team, other groups are following us. Um, and also recently we published our mini Lego, uh, which is the improved version of the, of the Lego concept. Again, switch, switch cap front end with a uh, uh, multi-phase uh, uh, switching doctor back end with couple magnetics. Uh, so this version um, uh, was able to uh, deliver very high uh, power density and also uh, in terms of power density is so two times higher than our our first version and you can see the packaging we have uh, it's vertical stacked one layer of semiconductor devices capacitors and then a couple of magnetics on top and overall thickness is about 8.5 millimeter and we're trying to uh, make it thinner in our hopefully next version so uh, this is just one example. Uh, we actually explored many other design options because this is very rich design space. We are trading power density, efficiency, and control speed, right? So, so different architecture can give you different um, uh, performance benefits. So we have a high density design, high efficiency design, and somewhat one design which is optimizing for thickness. The thickest, thickest um, version we have uh, have presented is about six millimeter in height, and the ultimate version is you have a processor on top, and then this is a connector sockets uh, connecting to the processor, and you feed your uh, power converter uh, in the middle. And we have demonstrated different designs, uh, some of them targeting high efficiency, some of them targeting high energy density or a balance between power density and efficiency, and one which is pushing for extreme uh, power density because the philosophy is that the processor, if your power electronics is 80% efficient, that means 80% of the power is burning in the processor. So if you are able to make the power electronics as small as possible, it's closer and closer to a processor, you're actually closer and closer to the cooling resources. So, so there are benefits in pushing for extreme power density while sacrificing energy efficiency. And that's sort of like the, 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 the why, this design space is different from other power electronic design space where efficiency is critically important. But here, if you can make things very, very small, uh, actually efficiency can can be, the, the constraint on efficiency can be relaxed a little bit. So we are researchers um, beyond just presenting the, the performance, like trying to push for the best performance. We're also very interested in understanding where is the performance limit, right? So if you are using the best technologies available uh, that we can get, uh, this is the performance we can demonstrate. But where's, which is the limiting, limiting factor? 
Uh, what we find is that, uh, first of all, if we look at the design, a uh, majority of the loss come from low side on resistance. This light green area is the uh, conduction loss in the in the MOSFET, which carries very high current. So basically, we still don't have good enough silicon or semiconductor devices that can carry high current at very low voltage. Uh, and companies like Infineon, Intel, and TSMC are looking into uh, better technologies that a uh, low voltage rating or uh, high current semiconductor devices that can help us to improve the energy efficiency. So efficiency limit limitation right now is on low voltage semiconductor devices. Uh, so for passive components, if we look at the uh, the weight breakdown and volume breakdown of our design, uh, although it's a very switch intensive design, we have 32 switches carrying a few hundred amps of current. But still, uh, if you look at the volume, it's only 4% of the weight and 2% of the volume of the overall system. And the majority of the system is dominated by magnetic capacitors, PCBs, including um, the, the PCB core and, and copper, and also connectors. Uh, so this means there are other, there are still opportunities for us to explore new architecture so that we can further reduce the size of the uh, magnetics and capacitors. Uh, for copper or conductors, probably not much because uh, basically this is a, uh, we need sufficient conductors to carry the high current. But in terms of energy storage, there are still rooms for us to explore novel architecture so that we can reduce the size of the passive components. So that's first example about architecture. How do we make best use of passive components to gain highest energy efficiency and power density? The next question is about control. Uh, how do we how do we uh, use this new design concept to enable better control performances? So I want to use flying capacitor multi-level converter as an example because it's a really good example for granular power motion. Uh, it naturally has many capacitors, uh, many switches, and in our particular case, because my group investigate heavily on magnetics, it also has many many cap magnetic components. And we try to look into how do we combine them in a nice way. So in, in terms of granular power conversion, there are three fundamental approach. One is you can do multi-phase interleaving, right? So you can divide it into many, many phases and you interleave them. And then that can give you advantage. You can do multi-level switching, uh, like many multi-level topologies, neutral point clamp or uh, flying capacitor multi-level or just uh, MMC, multi, uh, modular multi-level converters, multi-level switching allow you to uh, benefit from granular power processing. And finally, couple magnetics uh, allow you to allow us to get, get, get benefits because now, now instead of talking about just an inductor, we're talking about couple magnetics. So the question we're asking is that, what if we do all of this together? We do multi-phase coupling, multi-level stacking, and interleaving um, all together. Or in other words, we're talking about massive frequency multiplication because all of these give us a factor in multiplying. Uh, so if we multiply alpha times, beta times, and gamma times, then if you do all of them together, you get a massive uh, factor, frequency scaling factor in the system. Uh, so think about a, 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 a four-phase, uh, three-level uh, flying capacitor multi-level converter. You multi-level, you scale the, the switching frequency by multi-level switching. You scale the switching frequency by multi-phase interleaving. And you scale the frequency with a uh, couple of magnetics, and that really allows you to push up the effective switching frequency of the converter to very, very high level. So it looks great in, on paper, but now the system becomes a multi-resonant system or high-order, multi-order, high-order PWM system where you have capacitors and inductors all interacting with each other. And how do you balancing them? How do you make sure the current are well shared across all of them? Uh, how do you make sure you get benefits during the transient? There are all kinds of questions that raise up. Although fundamentally we get advantages, but there are a lot of interesting questions we can ask. Uh, and that's one of the area that we are we are extremely excited about. So there are a lot of existing study on uh, trying to understand how do you balance flying capacity multi-level converters. So in any granular circuits, you have to ask the question about balancing. Uh, and then there are new theories being developed in trying to understand the balance. There are new methods or technologies you can apply to ensure voltage balancing and current sharing. And what we find is couple magnetics is actually a very interesting uh, a mechanism in enabling uh, voltage balancing and current sharing in flying capacitor multi-level converter. 
It's a balance, passive balancing technique, meaning that you don't need active sensing and control, and you can scale this to very high frequency because if it's a passive um, system, you're not limited by the ADCs, you're not limited by your, the speed of your analog control loop. So re really, uh, uh, this couple magnetic combining with granular circuits opens up a new research field in understanding how does this multi-resonant uh, uh, high order PWM system uh, balancing each other and are there problems? What are the new problems they create and how do we how do we address all of these new problems? So uh, we start from comparing just two examples just to illustrate the concept. If you're designing a, let's say, a multiplying the frequency by four times two, so this is like eight times multiplication, you can do it either with a four-phase, three-level FCML or a two-phase, five-level FCML. So this will multiply the frequency by the same amount of time, uh, uh, the system. Which one is better? Or which one can give you a better balancing? Which one is more robust against all kinds of disturbances? Uh, and you can see that by, this is just like simulation um, uh, results, uh, or well, this is actual analytical results. Uh, so you can see there's a difference between the balancing capability. So the x-axis is the coupling coefficient of the couple magnetics. So assuming this is a four-phase couple magnetics uh, on the left-hand side and two-phase couple magnetics on the, on the right-hand side. And, and then we are plotting the voltage balance against a particular type of disturbances uh, as the, the coupling coefficient change. And you can see that these two systems behave differently. The four-phase three-level converter, uh, if your coupling coefficient is low, you will have some kind of significant balance, imbalance. And if, as the coupling coefficient increase and increase, the balancing get better and better. And in the middle, you're sort of falling into their interesting behaviors uh, in the four capacitors, which uh, we, we, oh, we dive down and study. Versus for the two-phase five level, on the low coupling coefficient, they look very similar. But at high frequency, if you don't do things right, they are actually this singularity point where you can get into interesting multi-resonant behavior of the system. That's what we're trying to understand here. So we look at the literature and it turns out there are no mature method or there are, they are different type of exploration, but none of them really, especially if you bring in couple magnetics, there are just no, no methodologies that can help us to explain it. So my student, Daniel Joe and uh, Professor Maskimovich, student Janko uh, Silkovic uh, from UC Boulder, uh, it becomes a collaboration, student-driven collaboration project. They were looking into, are there a theoretical framework to understand how does this multi-resonant balancing happen? And they developed a mathematical framework, which looking to the, the charge uh, feeling, we call it a balancing charge and disturbance charge, which forces the capacitors to imbalance uh, when, when the system has uh, are facing some kind of disturbances. Uh, and the system behavior can be described by a characterization matrix, which looks like this. And from by observing this matrix, we can learn about the system dy dynamics. And one interesting phenomenon we find is that if you have even number of phases, the A matrix is invertible. If you have odd number of matrices, the A matrix is non-invertible, meaning that if your H matrix is invertible, meaning means that your system has a steady state. Versus if a matrix is non-invertible, meaning that your system has multiple solution and it may oscillate among multiple possible steady states. So, so basically, this method allows us to sort of uh, understand how the system behaves by looking at the rank of the system. And the other thing what we find from this study is that the how much balancing you have uh, is related to the coupling coefficient of a couple magnetics. And the stronger coupling you have, the stronger balancing power you have. But on the other hand, you also run into the risk of the singularity point that, that we just explained. Uh, so there are also a different methods. So the previous method looking to the charge matrix, right? Uh, focusing on capacitor voltage balancing. Uh, you can also look into the current, right? So this is the method developed by CU Boulder where they look into the current balancing uh, of the multiple inductors. And what they find uh, is that again, if you use a couple magnetics, you can greatly reduce the singularity points for particular cases. But on the other hand, uh, you open into the risk at a particular uh, coupling coefficient and uh, special design considerations need to be uh, made uh, if you happen to put your coupling coefficient at a particular range. So uh, a, a fair a systematic method looking into both the uh, capacitor voltage balancing and, and inductor current uh, uh, Two, two type of state variables. 
Uh, a more recent advance, which we find as interesting, is now because this is a multi-phase uh, balancing system. Uh, and it's interesting to look into the system, look at the system as some kind of feedback system. Basically, the imbalance of one phase become a feedback mechanism, which help you to balance in the other phase. And and if the, the system has the right amount of feedback, the, the feedback is designed in the right way, then this is helping with the balancing. Uh, and if the system happen to get into some kind of singularity points, then the balancing is actually of one phase is amplifying the, the imbalance of the other phase, then the system get into this op oscillation mode. So I highly recommend you to uh, look into uh, our paper. Our, this paper is still under review, but we do have a, com uh, a paper upcoming uh, uh, explaining uh, uh, this feedback mechanism of thinking about um, high order PWM system balancing issue. Uh, we do have a few prototypes uh, uh, under making. So this is one uh, four phase five level FCML converter. You can see these are the uh, four phases uh, with one single couple magnetics. Uh, and this magnet is similar to the one that we show uh, in the uh, CPU voltage regulator project. Uh, we're sort of reusing the magnetic design across different, um, different uh, for different purposes. Uh, so each of these uh, switch pair is switching at one megahertz. And we have 16 pairs. So this is effectively multiplying the switching frequency by 16 times. And we are asking the question if we can, uh, we actually demonstrated that uh, by switching the system at one megahertz uh, with 16 times frequency multiplication, we can track a signal which is higher than the switching frequency. So basically switching frequency is not necessarily the design constraint because you can always go with this granular power conversion and get much, much higher uh, effective switching frequency and reduce the passive component size. Uh, so we are not satisfied with 16 times. We're actually going moving forward. This is the design of the 16 times where we can track a signal uh, at higher than the switching frequency. And we are working on a more aggressive design. So this is uh, for 16 level, 16, actually 17 level with 16 switching level, voltage levels. Um, uh, and each of the phase is 16 times multiplication and we have four phases. So this is really 64 uh, times multiplication. We are switching at one megahertz, uh, multiply the switching frequency by 64 times, and hopefully we can track a signal which is maybe 10 times higher uh, than the switching frequency. Uh, so we find it as a very interesting uh, system to study and try to understand the dynamics. How do, does the capacitors balance each other and how does the couple magnetics uh, bring in? What kind of opportunities and challenges Couple magnetic screening into this type of system. So that's a uh, question that we're trying to answer. Switching, we, we talk about power density, we talk about switching frequency, uh, uh, energy efficiency, we talk about the control bandwidth. Uh, and the next is materials. So, uh, one of the limitations, if we ask the uh, power training engineer, which part of the system is sort of like magic black box? And usually the answer is magnetics, right? So it's very hard to understand how does magnetics behave across wide operation range. Um, the small signal behavior of the magnetic components different from large signal. Uh, biasing the materials at different DC bias change the behavior. So that's what motivates us to look into how can we develop a better methods to model power magnetics and it turns out machine learning is a really, really good candidate, and we do have the tool uh, and methods. Um, the computer science people have really made the tool very easy to use, and we basically look into opportunities. How do we apply the state-of-the-art machine learning method to model the highly nonlinear, highly complex uh, power magnetic components? So most of us, if we open a book in any power electronics book, uh, the, when they talk about core loss or when they talk about magnetic Component materials is very simple. You say, well, you just use the three parameters, standard equation, to calculate core loss. And it's if it is inaccurate, it's inaccurate. It's the best we can do. Um, and if we look into the BH loop, we know magnetic material can be described by BH loop, but we know BH loop depends on temperature, depending on the waveform, depending on the DC bias, depending on the memory effect, depending on how magnetic material behaves now, depends on how it was excited in the past. So, so what we are really trying to do is that instead of modeling magnetic material with basic parameters in the statement equation, can we increase the number of parameters in a systematic way uh, and better describe the, the material behavior so that we can really optimize the material for 
for application like CPU processor, where you really probably want to optimize for 50 degrees C. We know that magnetic materials behavior change with temperature, but usually it was not offered in the data, data sheet and we have no way to really optimize for a particular operating point. Uh, so that's what really the Princeton Magnet project is trying to address is, are there better ways, are there better data-driven methods that we can better describe the materials across a wide operation range so that we can push for extreme uh, optimization. And we have published quite a lot of paper. I highly recommend you to read this why magnet paper, uh, basically answering the question, why do we need data-driven method to model power magnetics? And also how magnetics paper, how do you use the state of art methods to model magnetics in a better way? So to make it clear, uh, we know the material, magnetic materials behave differently. Statements equation, if you look in the data sheet, they're talking about sine wave. They're not talking about different triangle wave with different due to ratio with different DC bias, or even in the future, it could be multi-resonant waveform or multi-piecewise linear waveform. If we are coupling many magnetic components together, we're no longer talking about sine wave anymore. It's piecewise linear arbitrary waveform. And how does the material behave? How much, what, what are we talking about for the core loss? And core loss is very important if you are talking about vertical power delivery because we have to precisely model how much loss, how much heat is generating on the magnetic material. So, so if we think about this, it looks very much like a sequence to sequence problem. We have some kind of time domain waveform, arbitrary waveform, like let's say call B, uh, B field excitation. It's a sine wave. Um, or any waveform, time domain waveform. And we are interested in either edge. If you know B and edge, you calculate area, you get the core loss, or you are simply interested in a single number of core loss. So this is very similar to a machine learning problem like speech recognition or music detection. So you have some kind of, or stock price forecasting. You have some kind of time domain sequences and you apply regression or classification or progression so that you can sort of understand how the time domain, how the system behave uh, in a time domain. If you excite a magnetic material with the time domain signal uh, in voltage, what's the response in current? Or if you excite a material in current, what's the response in voltage? And that's how we think there are great opportunities in thinking about magnetic modeling as a sequence to sequence problem. The idea is very, very simple, but the, the work is very hard. Uh, we spend again, three to four years in understanding this problem. And the first problem is data. We don't have enough data. We need a, a, a automatic data acquisition system. Uh, so we spent about two years building a big enough database uh, with known quality because it doesn't make sense to train a machine learning model, which is 1% error if your measurement has 10% error, right? So in the end, the model's performance constrained by the accuracy of your data. So we really have to understand uh, how much error we're talking about in our automatic uh, core loss measurement system. Uh, we build a database, we build a website, and you can go to mag-net.princeton.edu and you can see our website containing all the information about magnet challenge. We develop machine learning methods. We control the data quality. We also hope that uh, because neural network model or data-driven model doesn't give us deep physical understanding of the system. So we hope that this database also allow us to develop new analytical understanding of the core material or perhaps even new physics. And finally, uh, we also collaborate with uh, companies like Praxem in understanding how do we, once we have the BH loop prediction, once we have the, the dynamic behavior of the material, can we close the loop and feed the information back to a spice so that you can really simulate, instead of simulating with a linear Mangan components, you can start to simulate with the nonlinear Mangan components and capture the core loss and hysteresis uh, into into and saturation into your in, into your into your design. So this is the big scope, uh, and there are different methods we have explored and we have looked into LSTM long short term memory network in trying to predict if you have a B uh, input is the B output is the H, and you have to consider temperature, frequency, and DC bias. So this is so-called encoder, projector, decoder uh, algorithm where you take the time domain information, map it to a different domain and combining the temperature, DC bias and frequency information, and then convert it back to decode it back to the time domain. Or you can use the transformer model. This is not the magnetic transformer. This is the machine learning transformer, which has been 
uh, very successful in uh, language model, la large language models and image uh, image um, um, classification algorithms, where basically it has some kind of encoding decoding, but also fact in the the the, the exciting it, it, during the training process, it also has this recurrent memory mechanism which remembers what it has been trained or what's coming next. So 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 there are all kinds of very interesting uh, algorithms that we can leverage uh, com uh, coming from the, the computer science community. So this is just one example. Uh, so this X bar is how much data the model sees. Uh, so at the beginning, it sees 20% of the data, then it's not doing very good prediction, but the more examples let's see, the model was able to more precisely predict what's happening uh, uh, in the magnetic material. And you can see that uh, as the model sees more and more data, uh, it was able to uh, predict the behavior of the material under arbitrary waveforms more precisely. Uh, and this is actually our old, our old results. Um, so, so these models uh, with about 27,000 parameters, we were able to cut the uh, prediction error down to uh, about average error is about 4%. For this particular material, of course, this material dependent. Different materials, some materials is more noisy, other materials is more smooth. So in general, what we show is that uh, by leveraging the state of the art neural network models, we are able to get very precise uh, models for modeling power magnetics against all kinds of uh, uh, influencing factor temperature, flux density waveforms. And the newest result, we're running the magnet challenge. The best teams that were able to demonstrate, they were able to cut this number down to a few hundred. So we are talking about 27K about a couple of months ago, but after we run this competition, other teams actually beat us by 100 times. So there are more advanced neural network models or more advanced methods that can really, instead of talking about three parameters, we know three parameters won't capture all the interesting behavior of the main material, but if you use a few hundred parameters or even a few tens of parameters, it's capable of capturing the sophisticated behavior of the magnetics and give us very precise model uh, across wide operation range, and you don't need long time to train it. So it's a, a huge, huge amount of room to explore uh, in this area. We also look into transfer learning. Uh, transfer learning is a machine learning concept, meaning that if you have very limited amount of data for a new task, but you have a huge amount of data for existing tasks, you can pre-train a neural ne network model with the huge amount of data that already exists for a similar task, and then fine tune the model with the new data coming from the new material. So this is very similar to a practical power magnetic design challenge where you have very good understanding of uh, existing material, but there's a new material coming, but you only have very limited amount of data. And we find that it's very effective to apply transfer learning, which doesn't exist in statement equations, doesn't exist in analytical methods. So machine learning, a very good advantage of machine learning is that you can pre-train, it needs a lot of data, uh, but if you have a problem where you have a lot of existing data for a similar problem, you can always pre-train a model with existing data and fine tune the model with new data, and that can greatly reduce the data requirements uh, on a new problem you're trying to solve, and we're we are able to dem demonstrate that uh, transfer learning at least can usually reduce the number of data requirements by 10 times or even more. Uh, so what we are thinking is in the future, there could be a well-maintained open source uh, data-driven model for power magnetics. And every time when there's a new material coming in, we fine tune it and then rapidly we can get a good enough mo uh, model for understanding the new material because usually the new material is a fine tune from the chemical side of view. It's a fine tuning of a previous material. If we understand pre pre previous material well, we only need a small amount of data to understand the new, the new material. So this is one example of a knowledge model for power magnetics. So we know ChatGPT, which is saying, well, computers start to understand the language and contain all of the knowledges that we have. We can also train sort of like a magnet agent, which knows the information about magnetics. And every time when there's a new material coming, it can we can improve itself and train itself. And ultimately, it could be a material recommendation system, right? We tell it all right, I'm designing a power converter with the magnetics running at this operating condition. Can you give me a recommendation of what kind of material is the best for to fit for this application and how do we design it? And then we have a preliminary version implemented on this website where you put in your particular operating condition, 
how does the V and edge and how does the frequency and temperature and DC bias looks into. And we'll run a sweep of all of the materials that we have already trained and give you a ranked performance um, uh, uh, per performance ranking here. And you can select the material uh, based on this, um, this uh, uh, magnetic agent or magnet AI. So, uh, so ultimately, we want to build an ecosystem. We find uh, it's not enough just our own team, one team working on it. It's not enough. Uh, we hope that the entire community can join us and, and do this all together. So, so that's why we launched this Princeton Magnet Project and Magnet Challenge. Uh, on one side, we try to understand better physics. On the other side, we try to hopefully we can lead to uh, better design. Uh, so the Magnet Challenge uh, attracted over 100 teams interested in it, 40 teams registered. 25 teams participated in the qualification and 24 teams are in the final evaluation. So some of audiences, you are probably participating in the Magnet Challenge now, uh, and we're going to reach out to you very soon. We're evaluating the results uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, reach out to you very soon and try to understand more information and select the winner in the coming, coming few weeks. And these are the results, preliminary results. I cannot release uh, all of these stars, X axis, the X accuracy ranking. We have 25 teams participating, uh, and we're comparing the accuracy and the size of the model. Each dots representing a team, uh, and then the best team is about reaching about a single digit error in core loss prediction uh, with about 100 parameters. So we call it 2023 state of art. Is that you can probably model a material with a 100 parameters or so, and still getting a single digit uh, percentage error uh, in terms of core loss prediction. And hopefully, probably there are still rooms to further improve it. So that's the three area, uh, three main area that is going on uh, in our group's research. Uh, beyond this, we're also looking to Power Electronics Plus X. Uh, how do we make Power Electronics better to enable other applications, not centrally within power electronics. So we look into robotics. So this is one converter, PSO electric uh, actuators driven by uh, power electronics. You need low voltage, high, high voltage to, to high voltage, very lightweight, miniaturized power, power electronics for this. Uh, there's also space power. Uh, how do you design power electronics that are red hard, uh, radiation hard, and plasma power? How do you design high frequency power electronics drive the plasma systems? Uh, we don't have enough time to cover it today. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to, if you, have, if you are interested, you can look at our publications uh, and happy to happy to talk. So this is final slides. Uh, our goal, Princeton's uh, motto is we are in the service of humanity and in the service of the nation. So power electronics playing very important roles in making our lives better and fighting against the climate change, enable uh, transportation electrification. So there are all kinds of interesting opportunities uh, in power electronics. And also there are interesting way of thinking about how do we design power electronics and how do we leverage the more advanced tools to, to improve or rethink about the way we do design and, and optimization. So with this, I want to conclude my talk and I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you very much. We would like um, to thank you, Professor Chen, for um, your time and this very interesting presentation. We'll now start answering questions that came in during the webinar. Thank sure. you. Uh, I didn't see any. Oh, are there questions? Oh, there, there are questions here. Let's see. Which one? All the questions are in the question box. If you please read them yes. uh, verbally and answer them verbally. Thank you very much. I can see that. Uh, there are a couple of questions. One, uh, first question comes from AJ Klo. Uh, do you think thermal management would be critical and important in vertical power delivery shown on slide 12? Yes, that's very important. Uh, and that's sort of um, uh, one of the limitations on how thin you can make. Uh, and uh, one of the limitations on uh, materials, how do you bring the heat out, right? So uh, one good news is that the thinner you make, the thinner, the closer it is close to the processor, and it becomes the same problem as how do you cool the processor. And there are a lot of research and, um, um, and um, there are a lot of research and, and efforts getting to how do you cool the chips itself, the process itself, and it can probably be solved in a similar way. Uh, on the other side is how do you make it efficient, right? So um, if you if thermal management is a problem, um, then then really 
uh, stress us to improve the energy efficiency. So, um, so I would say the, the solution is twofold. One is better methods to cool a 2D surface. Uh, and second is how do we uh, reduce the height, but at the same time, improve the energy efficiency. Uh, next question uh, from Sam AJ. Uh, do you consider ESRs of capacitors to plot the dynamic shown in slide 16? Uh, let me see what is slide 16. Slide 16 is this one. Oh, no. Oh, no. oh slide 15, I guess. So this one, ESR capacitors, I believe, let's see, I, for, I think, uh, I don't think so. I think this is not including the ESR of the capacitors, but it may include the ESR of the inductors. We may have lumped all of the conduction loss in a, in a path as one resistor, but I'm not 100% sure. It has been a while since we developed this model. I'm not 100% sure what we assumed here, but my intuition says we should have, we may have considered it as a lumped resistors, the entire path as a lumped, one lumped resistors. Well, I think so, because you have to damp it, right? So we should have considered resistance, the path, resist path in the system. Otherwise, there's no way to damp the, there's no way to damp the ring. Uh, let me see, the next question, uh, have you done cost analysis comparing traditional methods with your proposed topologies? So no, we don't. We haven't compared cost because cost is a very tricky question to ask because it really depends on the scale, right? So you making one converter and making one million converter is very different. And fundamentally, your cost of polytronics come from how much material you are using, magnetic capacitors and semiconductors. Uh, so magnetic capacitors, in terms of cost density, maybe semiconductors is the highest. But semiconductors is only 2% of the size and 4% of the volume, and magnetic capacitors are higher, right? So, so I guess uh, it's always tricky. And from our side, from the researcher side, we're interested in the fundamental limitation. Uh, and we believe that if you can demonstrate the fundamental benefits, there are interesting opportunities for the companies or industry to explore uh, how does the cost can trade off. And if you things if things scale, uh, and Apple making it. It's very different from other company making it, right? So it's just like cost is this. It's very hard to really make an apple to apple rigorous comparison on cost. Uh, and one way to partially address that is to look at the fundamental energy storage requirements, uh, semiconductor stress, uh, and other limitations. But I will say uh, we don't have the capability of really do a rigorous analysis on cost. Uh, Next question, can you elaborate a bit more from Hong Kenju? Uh, could you elaborate a bit more why the efficiency constraint can be relieved for XPU power conversion application? Oh, it's just simply because if you make things small, you can gain a lot, right? So as I said, uh, in other application, making power electronics small is just making power electronics small. In processor application, making power electronics small means you can make the processor faster means that you can make the uh, chip to chip communication faster. So you're winning a lot from other things by making things small. Uh, and efficiency, again, well, yeah, efficiency is important in other applications. If you're doing solar, then efficiency is everything. If you're doing battery related application, efficiency is super important because that ties to how big of a battery is. But in this application, if you can say, I can reduce the uh, power electronics by 10 times, by paying 10% or 20% more size or 10%, 20% more loss. That's not a huge issue because they have to deal with a lot of heat anyways. If you talk about 100 watts processor, it's 100, 100 watts of heat. And if we're talking about 90% of power electronics, we're talking about 10 watts of heat. So we are talking about, in terms of cooling requirements, the cooling requirements only increase from 100 watts to 110 watts. 1% less efficient is just 1% of more heat cooling requirements, but if you can get more from the computing side, there are actually a lot of interest uh, coming from the company. That's simply because of the, the uniqueness of this particular application where you can get much more value by making things small because you gain the benefits from computing side. Uh, the next question, uh, with the granular design, what happens when the capacitor or semiconductor fails? 
uh, is it possible to build robust converters that do not fail catastrophically when individual components fail? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, it's uh, it's always a trade-off, right? If you have one massive component, uh, what if it fails? If it fails, then the entire system fails. 100 capacity, 100% 100 of the capacity fail. Versus in a granular system, then if 1% of the device fail, you fail, you lose 1% of the capacity. So it's really uh, opportunity and the challenge. Uh, well, yes, your sensing becomes more complicated, your protection is more complicated, but if you can embed voltage sharing current balancing mechanism in a system, maybe your system don't break that often, and you can probably get more uh, safety design margin. So yes, um, granular power conversion, if you think about robustness or reliability, they are, these are new type of challenge. But the good news is that the digital electronics, the processor has billions of transistors and they never fail. Uh, and modular multi-level converters has hundreds or thousands of modular units and they are in practical use. So I would say there are new challenges, but I, was, I don't see a fundamental reason why it cannot be solved. Uh, but at least for researchers, these are still very interesting questions to ask. Uh, the next question from Hang Yao Liu, uh, if we want to select capacitors under 3 megahertz and the limited area around 80 millimeters square and 3 millimeters height with a total capacitance of 100 microfaraday, then it's better to choose silicon capacitor or MLCC capacitor. So you're talking about 80 millimeters square. Uh, I would say that's already very large. Uh, go with silicon may not be in the best option from a cost perspective, although I already said it's very hard to evaluate from the cost, but just from looking from far away, it sounds like if you're talking about tens of millimeters square of capacitors, then maybe you go with discrete. And if you go with discrete, then maybe MLCC is a better option. Uh, so I would say if you are in the millimeter square, single digit millimeter square, then silicon capacitors is attractive from a cost perspective and density perspective uh, and lower ESR perhaps, because you can have better packaging integration. But if you're talking about tens of millimeter square uh, and three millimeter height, maybe MMLCC will be my first rea reaction. But of course, it's a, it's a case by case uh, uh, trade-off design consideration there. Okay, uh, I guess that's all we have. Uh, I don't see any other question. Yeah, correct. I can't see any other questions mm -hmm. coming in, actually. Thank you very much for taking time reading and answering the question. Thank you. Just as a reminder to everyone, information on how to request a PDH certificate has been sent to you via the chat function and will also be included in the following up email you will receive within one hour of completion of the webinar. Today's webinar will be placed on the Power Electronic Society Resource Center within the next week. For information on upcoming webinars, please visit our website, ieee-pels.org. Um, this includes today's webinar, actually. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and thank you very much, Professor Chen. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.